uh, ever since I've been connecting with the dragons, I've been really just tuning into their energy and really calling them in during any moment that I remember, including times when I am I'm down, I need some assistance, some guidance, or if I just want to awaken my dragon heart. And what we're going to be going through now, and um, I'm going to go through this a little fast so we can get through this, is the cosmic dragons and my regressions experiences with the dragons. So this one, there are many civilizations and tribes of dragons. And when I had the regressions where I first connected with them, I wasn't aware of that. But then afterwards, through conversations, the dragon energy coming strong, year of the dragon starts in February. So all of this information had been coming out um, and all these interactions occurring and people having conversations about dragons. Right now, we said the word dragon. Look at all the comments that's going on in the chat. Why is that happening? It's almost too magical, too synchronistic to, to ignore, right? That there is something going on right now with this whole concept of dragons. When I had my regression and I saw the red dragon tribe and the red dragon that I'm connected to, his name is Kumpala, is my cousin in the dragon realms. When I saw that, um, like funny things happen. Like I had no idea that the computer I'm having is an MSI computer, the, my laptop. The logo is a red dragon. I've had this for like four or five years. And I was with my friend recently and I was telling her the story of the dragon realms. And she was like, well, look at your computer. And it's a red dragon right there. Every time I open my computer, there's a red dragon, but I'm not even paying attention to it opening. So all these types of synchronicities are occurring. So we'll start with some background. East versus West dragon folklore. In Western mythology and folklore, dragons are often depicted as menacing creatures to be defeated. They're seen as symbols of chaos, evil, and destruction. Stories of knights or heroes slaying dragons, such as the famous legend of St. George, portray the triumph of good over evil. This narrative of conquering the dragon represents overcoming challenges or vanish, van, uh, vanquishing malevolent forces. And then, then we see the Eastern cultures, of course, where dragons hold revered and benevolent status. They're associated with power, strength, wisdom, good fortune. In Chinese and Japanese and other East Asian traditions, they're considered divine creatures that bring rain for agriculture. So we see dragons a lot of times in a connection to agriculture and rain. They're guardians of important places. And like someone said recently, Mia Magic, when I interviewed her, she was saying um, last week that they are the guardians of treasures and represent imperial authority. They are symbolic of auspicious energy, prosperity, fun fertility, and longevity. And we have the Chinese dragon. The dragon is a symbol of power, strength, and fertility, also associated with good luck and abundance and abundance of crops. We have Quetzalcoatl, Azteca Maya, feathered serpent deity in Mesoamerican cultures. As the god of wind, air, and learning, Quetzalcoatl was associated with fertility and the renewal of life. His connection to wind and rain made him bringer of prosperity and agricultural abundance. And of course, you have the Nagas in Indian mythology, the serpent beings, they're associated with water and fertility as well. And Ryu in Japanese folklore is a dragon-like being associated with water, agriculture, and fertility. They were believed to reside in bodies of water and control rainfall, ensure good harvest and overall well-being of the land. There seems to be a huge connection with dragons and fertility, not only the fertility of um, you know, the abundance of crops and agriculture, but fertility in the re in the birthing process as well. And that was my in with the dragon information, which I'll get into in a moment, was how the dragons, the specific civilization that I'm connected to, are stewards of the birthing process. We have Marduk, Babylon mythology, was symbolized by the dragon, played a crucial role in creating the world and maintaining its order. His role in cosmic fertility and creation made him central to Babylonian religion. We have Kulka Khan in the Maya, associated with fertility, rain, and agriculture as well. We have Amugi in the Korean mythology, benevolent dragon that dwells in the water. Appearance was believed to bring rain and ensure fertile, fertile field. Native American horn serpents, myths about horn serpents, which often symbolize rain, water, fertility. Balinese as well, the Balinese culture, the Barong lion-like creature represents the triumph of good over evil and the balance of nature. So we see the dragons being used in two ways, almost like being used by some traditions as representing evil and then the human triumphing over it. And then in other ways, we're seeing it as a representation of abundance and the triumph of good over evil in itself as the serpent, like the serpent giving us the insight of how to do that. But it seems to be in many of these traditions, 
connected to some sort of fertility, the fertility of Mother Earth. My journey into the dragon realm and other reptilian ancestry. So I'm going to take a moment here. I just want to check the chat and because I really want to take a breath before I get into um, this presentation because what we're going to do now is we're going to go on story time. Okay. So this, what went down was a year ago, here in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, I had a, actually, no, it was two years ago with Joan in Mount Shasta, Geraldine Orozco, who's one of the speakers, came and did a regression for me. And I visited the third star on the right in Orion's belt. I had no idea it was Orion's belt at that time. And I was seeing myself interacting on the planet, engaging with other extraterrestrial beings. I saw what my job was, my responsibilities, all this stuff. And then a few months later, when I was here in Playa del Carmen, I had a regression with Bridget Rainey Holiday also speaking on this platform. And then halfway into the presentation, all of a sudden I go visit the Dragon Realms. And when I ask them, why am I seeing this? I go to the same planet in Orion's Belt. And I realize now, I, then I realize the connection that it was Orion's Belt. A few months later, I'm, taking a, I'm doing a plant medicine experience. And all of a sudden, my reality around me changes and I'm standing on the planet again right long story short and i'll show you guys real quick what i'm going to be doing to talk about this story before i get into this other one okay i will be doing this presentation in a few months in portal to ascension that's about that it's called the orion portal reptilian history galactic wars and stargate to earth okay this is going to be like uh, I'm going to do like another two to three regressions before I get this presentation done. But in August, I'm going to be doing that where we talk about the Ryan portal. But the long story short component is that I was on this planet and I was in charge of the stargates. Orion has one of the largest stargates to Earth, uh, to lower frequencies, dimensional experiences. I don't know if it's just Earth. And I was in charge of the portal rooms. If you guys have seen Thor... You know the, the the rainbow light bridge guy that has that like trident and he's at the rainbow light bridge and he's the guardian of who can come in and out of that dimensional experience? Yes, in the chat if you know what I'm talking about. So that was me. I That was my actual role in some lives until there was a takeover of the Stargate and then I was engaged in a war in order to try to get back the technology that was lost, right? And... The, the portal, right, I'm doing a whole, this is a reveal, guys, because I'm doing a whole article on this. Like, I'm, it's the first time I'm telling anybody besides my friends. The name, the nickname of the portal that I was in charge of was called the portal to descension, okay? It was called the portal to descension. So I was literally on this planet guarding the portal for people to go and descend to a lower dimensional experience. Um, and then... I came to Earth and I created the portal to Ascension. And so it's quite literally an etheric, actually it's like pretty much a physical thing created through events and everything. So the portal to Ascension is the is the reverse or the, of the descension portal that I used to be in charge of. So now I'm incarnated onto Earth basically to take people back after sending them down here. There's no judgment on it because people wanted to go down here. But I thought that was very interesting. And that part, the last component came to me in the in my plant medicine ceremony. And I was like automatic writing for hours, all that information. So that that's kind of the backstory for me to get into this presentation here. So I'm going to put my storyteller hat on. As I'm being regressed, I'm asked. I'm asked by Bridget Renee Holiday, where am I, right? This is how it started, how it started. All of a sudden I see myself in the depths of space in the darkness of space. And I look like a, a Native American man in his twenties from North America. I'm in this translucent bubble where I can see through it. And I'm looking right down at earth. I'm looking down at earth and I can just see myself floating there. I'm asked, why am I there? What else do you see? And then all of a sudden, in that moment, behind me, behind the translucent bubble, I see infinite bubbles of myself in all different types of ways, of different types of humans, all actually human experiences. And I saw every incarnation behind me that I've ever had on Earth. And when I tuned into what was I seeing, what incarnations, 
I got the download that I was actually seeing all parallel versions of myself as well. Not just versions of myself that existed on Earth, but also parallel versions of me that existed on other planets. Bridget says to me, can you go down to Earth? I'm trying to fly down to Earth, but I can't make it. I can't go through the ozone. It won't let me go through there. And I keep trying and trying and flying towards Earth, but I can't get through. And I get this message that space is not outside. Space is from within. And all of a sudden, I see myself from inside the Earth coming out from the planet, inner planet, to the outside Earth. I couldn't go from outside in the atmosphere because the planet was a holographic projection and I couldn't enter like that. The only way to enter the hologram was to go inside the inner Earth and actually be incarnated into the experience through the inner Earth portal. And then now, so I'm flying to Earth. I see myself as a baby, as a fetus, right? And I'm also seeing myself flying to Earth and trying to get to Earth at the same time. And then in the next scene, I'm on the planet and I look at my hands, I look up in the sky and I'm taking a look and I see that I have, I'm a baby. I'm like a two, three year old baby. I'm white and I'm a little baby girl. And I'm playing with this red dragon, this paper red dragon, just playing with it in front of me, looking at it and giggling. And as I'm doing this, as I'm doing this, I'm seeing a spirit of a red dragon float all around me, go in, out, around, all over. And I'm giggling and laughing and having a good time with this dragon. And then Bridget says to me, are you connected with the dragons? And I say, yeah, the spirit of the dragons are with me. She asks me, do you want to dive deeper? I say, yes. I see different reptilians. And she goes, do you mean saroids? So saroids is another name for reptilians that don't like to be called and, um, and um, blanketed with the other reptilians that we hold with negative agendas, the cosaroids. And then I say, yes. And this is what I see next. I see myself in portrait shapes, almost exactly like this, right? Three portraits of myself as different reptilian beings. The first one, I have a fish head with a reptilian body. The second one that you see all the way to the right, I see myself as a duck head with a reptilian body. And then the last one, I see myself as this guy in the middle here, a royal scholar, a reptilian scholar from another world with this huge cape on top of a mountain. It's almost exactly like this image there. The only difference is in the portrait I saw, there was this huge mansion on top of the hill behind me. And I say to myself, why am I seeing this? You know, it, when I have regressions, it's like, it's a level of how much do you trust what you're seeing, right? And I did not expect to see dragons. I did not expect to see reptilians. That's not wasn't even in my consciousness, but I was taken there, which made me even believe it even more and trust and lean into the experience. And then the answer is, why am I seeing this? And the answer, dragons are the ancestors of these beings and all reptilians in our galaxies. These are all descendants of the dragon realms, of the dragon beings. And I get the awareness that the dragon beings, you know, when humans came into this galaxy, this was pretty much a serpentine galaxy and insectoids. But the, the rulers and the advanced technology were all serpentine reptilian races, including the dragons. The civilization I was connecting with in that moment was seemed to have become etheric. So I think maybe at one point they were physical and now they're pure etheric beings. They've ascended. But a lot of these dragon races were actually the ancestors to the reptilians, including the reptilians that became nefarious and had a negative experience with the earth humans. So they wanted me to know this. They wanted me to know that we are the ancestors and that we're genetically connected to them. The dragons, they're content, wise, passionate beings. This is what I was experiencing and that teach children wisdom and harness abilities to provide protection. So when I was seeing myself as this th um, two to three year old baby, uh, white baby girl, and I was playing with this dragon, this dragon would morph into different types of experiences and people. And I realized that this dragon was not only my like friend, 
um, but also was my imaginary friend. So a lot of times when children have imaginary friends, from my experience over here, is they're actually real entities. And it could actually be a dragon spirit that manifests in different ways. The dragons seem to be beings that are actually here to um, support us in not only stewarding in the birth the, of the human, but also are here to give us um, a buffer, if you will, from this other reality we come to, to Earth. You know, it's kind of a shock being incarnated here, coming out into a womb, crying, where am I? Um, not having, remembering your connection to source, but not having the ability to maneuver and move and then someone else having to take care of you, the dragon spirits, the red, the red dragon tribe that I was connected to at least, were actually ones that were helping buffer in that um, transitionary phase. And they were with us for the first three years of our life. While our brains are being formed, while the DMT in our brain is very strong, they're there with us and we're able to see and interact with them. In essence, as I said, they're the buffer zone for us to enter this experience of Earth. They provide health, playfulness and energetic support to children. But the question I still had was, is this for all children? All that are being born on earth? I felt it was, but I could not be certain. So after this experience, somebody else told me that they had a dragon experience and the dragons were actually um, only here for certain star seeds and they're not here for everyone. I, I didn't have any experience with that, so I can only speculate on what they said. But it's a question I still have is, is that the birthing process altogether? Because think about it, like the womb, if, if you believe we're not just a bunch of um, cells and chemistry and biological um, um, activity occurring, but we actually have a soul, how does the soul enter the womb, right? The womb in itself is like a, a black hole or a white hole. It's a, it's a literal portal from another dimension, right? So the soul is coming out in, in through that womb. How does it get there? So from what I saw was that there is a dragon spirit that actually brings the soul into the womb. So as I was saying, show me more, show me more. I'm taken to the North Pole of Earth. And this is what I see in the North Pole. I saw a visual of Earth in the North Pole with a red and white spinning vortex with an entrance into hollow Earth. The dragon say to me, this is where we come from into this is where we come from into earth and bridget says dragons will you take us to the portal and show us how this works and then all of a sudden i see a red dragon enter my third eye and another one came into my face and went right into my heart and now i'm inside earth i'm inside earth and this is what i see there's this beautiful translucent pool inside the middle of earth and around it, there are all these dragons. And they're ethereal dragons floating in space, moving around. And out of this blue pool, souls of babies, of children, come out. When the soul comes out, the dragon collects the soul, caresses the soul, and then goes and basically deposits it or implants it into a womb. And I was seeing that the dragon spirit literally takes the soul of the human and takes it through the womb portal and the and brings the soul into the body that is now being created, right? And this is what the translucent pool looked like. And there were dragons all around it. And when I was tuning in and asking, like, I was thinking, like, do souls come through from space? And what I kept getting was, no, like, everything is subatomic, right? We're all made of subatomic particles. Newtonian physics is atom and above, but ultimately the way inward, the way into other dimensions, the way through wormholes, the way to bend space and time is through the subatomic particle. Well, the subatomic particle isn't an external expansion. It's an inward, it's inward experience, right? So you go through the subatomic particle and that's how the earth works as well. Earth is like one subatomic particle in itself. And the souls don't come from space because space is a holographic projection of our own consciousness holographic projection of the subatomic world within. The souls come from the subatomic particles inside our Earth. This area was the life force of Earth, the origination of souls. And as I said, souls do not come from outside, they come from within the planet and birth by our planet. We're literally birthed by the Earth in this translucent pool in the middle of the planet. All physicality reflects the inner world. 
Dragon spirits are ready to go with you as your soul exits this incarnational system. So I saw dragons of different colors with a dragon face, but the bodies of serpents with no legs, they're all floating, like kind of like this. You can see they're all just floating. They're like, they had no legs. Again, why am I being shown this? Why am I being shown this? And I have an audio clip of my regression. So let me just make sure you guys can hear the audio. Why am I being shown this? This planet is more connected to the serpents than anybody wants to admit. Yeah. Serpents, as I already know, is my human self, are not evil or inherent evil. There are all types of experiences, benevolent ones are as important as the others. Benevolent ones do not need to be acknowledged. They don't need to receive praise. They don't need to have an ego boosted. They understand the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. They're full service. And beautiful service is allowing the free will for those to hate them, even if they are the ones connected to any nefarious experiences for our humans. But the dragons are different. The dragons are respected. Dragons are revered, but the offspring of the dragons are all those reptilian, serpentine beings, and all those that have the DNA that connects to what they originally created, including humans. Why am I being shown this? They are connected to us. And when I said in the end, you might not have heard the last part that. They are the, the ancestors to all the reptilian races, including humans. They have a huge role in, in what's going on this earth. And they're so unconditional and so non-egotistical and so benevolent that they have not been on the forefront. They've been in the back in basically lending us their support without needing to come in the forefront. But the reason why it's shifting, the reason why we're having all these dragon conversations now is because there is something called the dragon heart. What I saw, and I don't know if I'm sharing about this later, but on age three, the dragon coils up in your heart. A actual etheric existing dragon coils up in the heart. Bridget asked me, said, can you, can you ask the um, dragon to not coil up in your heart and just to stay awake? And then I said, no. The dragon says it's so unconditional that it's not here to do the work for us. It's here to help us during the first three years and then it goes dormant inside our heart, even though it's just kind of sleeping there, waiting for us to awaken the dragon heart, right? And that's what my slogan of my presentation I'm going to do is going to be called Awaken the Dragon Heart. And it's waiting for us. And we go incarnation after incarnation of not waking it up. But right now, part of the evolution of humanity is to awaken the dragon heart within us. And as so that's why, from my perspective, and there's probably many other reasons from other people's experiences the dragons are coming back now in full force it's time for us to awaken the dragon heart the dragons would love for a day to come where we do not just look into the sky for those beings that look like us but to find commonality and also realize we are connected through genetics and ancestry to beings that look nothing like us there was a whole download on galactic racism galactic speciesism that you know it's hard for us many people on this earth not a lot, but not, I wouldn't say not majority, but there's a lot, a lot of people that see the others in other people, right? And, and have this type of us against them mentality, or you look different mentality. And they're like, hey, you really got to realize that when you connect to the universe and cosmos, you might connect with people that look similar to you at first, but you're going to start seeing beings that look nothing like you. And you're going to be surprised to know how much of a genetic and soul connection 
you may have with these beings. Earth is a racist planet, but it's not race based on just the Earth experience of race. It's the race based on other races. They would love for me to figure ways to move past this. I asked them, why am I seeing this? I kept asking them over and over and over. And what I got was galactic racism. It's actually speciesism, really. Like, I'm just saying that racism because of the easier way of us understanding that term. And they said to me, I want you to create events to show people how to move past speciesism because as we have disclosure in galactic community that there's going to be those people that are really afraid of the other and how can we bridge the gap? Also, I've had a few, um, a few, I guess, paradigm awareness shifts in the last few years that it seems that many different galactic beings, many, I don't know if it's all of them or most of them or how many, have donated DNA to the Earth experience. Now, many of these planets, you fifth dimensional Sirius, seventh dimensional Pleiades, whatever, there's not as many species as there are on Earth. Some of them have one or two different species there. Think about how many hundreds of thousands, maybe even more than that, species we have on this planet. Many of these species have been influenced from DNA from different types of beings. There's ant-related beings, right? You heard about the ant beings in the Hopi prophecy. There's cockroach-type beings. There's mantis beings. There's reptilian beings that are connected to reptilians on our planet, right? So it's they were saying that figure out ways to help move humanity past this us against them kind of mentality. And a part of that is realizing the interconnectedness of all things, right? How we're all interconnected. Yesterday on a panel we did, um, Matthew John, also a speaker today, he, I think it was him, he mentioned how is, there's two different types of genetics. There's soul, like your spirit genetics that have different types of ET incarnational experiences. And then there's your body that also has different your lineage, your ancestry on earth that have different types of ETs that created your physical experience. So there's a combination of two different things going on. Your soul might have incarnated in many different places, but then you now incarnate into an earth body that maybe has been a direct descendant of some sort of Palladian civilization or something like that. So the name of my dragon counterpart that came to me the one that brought me into this world from the center of our planet, when I asked the name, the name is Kumpala. Kumpala from the Red Dragon tribe. And we asked Kumpala to blend with me. And I saw two or three dragons spin around, right? So spinning around me. And then Kumpala asked me if I would like to channel a message in dragon language for him. And you heard me do some dragon light language in my spoken word piece. That was the first time I ever recorded it. And this is the moment that this language came to me. And this is what it looked like, the two dragons spinning around me and the red dragon. So Kumpala was, is my counterpart in the dragon realm. So I saw myself in space as a red dragon floating with Kumpala. We're, I don't know if it's what it was, but we're family, we're twin flames, we're cousins. I kept getting that Kumpala was my cousin and we would be floating in space as cedars of planets and worlds, floating together in synchronized sequence where we would go basically make the same maneuvers at the same time. And I saw us floating through space. And when I came down to earth and I made the decision to come down to earth, I asked Kumpala to come and wait for me. Will you be the steward of my birthing process? And Kumpala came and waited for me. And I saw Kumpala waiting on this rock 
inside the earth, waiting for my soul to come out of the translucent pool there. And I saw the, the dragon actually take me and bring me into the womb. And then after three years of, I, you know, after my third year, I saw Kumpala coil up in my heart and go dormant. And after this moment, when the dragon light language came to me, and now every now and then when I have opportunity to remember this, I do a whole invocation where I awaken the dragon heart within myself. So after three years of actively interacting with us, the dragon spirits coils up in the heart, waiting for us to activate it. Many of us go lifetimes without doing this. Why did you not? Why do they not continue to interact with us throughout our lives? That was the question I had. Why don't they continue to interact with us? Well, they are there in order to just offer support and lend their energy, but unconditionally allow us because we signed up to come here into this contrast experience. We signed up to come with amnesia. So for them to come and to keep giving us remembrances and remind us of who we are would take away from the original purpose of us getting here. But as we remember, as we eventually wake it up to, oh my God, this is who, we, who I am. This is why I incarnated. These are the lives that I had, right? And as we heal amnesia, then we also recreate that connection to our dragon counterparts. And then the next chapter, I think this is the almost the end here. The next chapter is the journey to Orion and the portal world. So the one I just showed you the presentation off, we're going to be doing a whole presentation on that. Uh, I'm going to be doing one on the stargates of Orion, portal to descension, what happened on the planet. I remembered moments from the war when I was protecting the stargate. I remember when I was um, the portal was taken over and when they left. And when they left Orion, these people, these beings, they took a crater god technology, a technology that creates and feeds life. And they came to Earth and they began utilizing this technology. And the portal planet in this, in, on this, this portal on this planet was then shifted to be utilized for people to go in and regain and try to get pieces and fragments, fragments of the lost technology to rebuild it. Because the planet in Orion that I was from was dying. And it was dying because the technology was an organic technology that basically gave life and abundance to that planet. And the only way we could save that system, that whole system with the star and everything, was to regain the technology. So Bridget then took me into the future, into the mo now moment, from this moment to now. And we went and visited this planet. And this planet was a beautiful, lush oasis. It was um, vibrant with life, um, all types of experiences, all types of exotic animals. And it seems like that, you know, the technology had been rebuilt and that planet was thriving. So they took me there. The dragons took me to Orion to show me what happened. They have a deep sorrow. They have a deep sorrow for what occurred and for and want us to be at peace, especially what happened with the reptilians. They love us as much as they love the reptilians, including the reptilians that have done nefarious things to the planet. And they have a deep sorrow. It's like watching your kid do a criminal activity and then not being able to rehabilitate them because they're grown adult and living in another country. You know what I'm saying? So it's like they have a deep sorrow for what occurred and they want for us to be at peace. They want us to understand that the, the reason why these wars occurred was because of woundings, not being seen, not being heard, not being received, um, uh, feeling unacknowledged, feeling disconnected from source. So it's, it's almost like our destiny to bring peace to those that we feel are opposing us, to bring peace and awareness to those that we feel are wronging us, including the offspring of one of the civilizations of the offspring of the dragons that were the reptilians. So we are, in essence, siblings at war with each other, much like the story in the Mahabharata where there's two brothers on either side. And that's what's going on with this cabal against us, good against evil. These are two siblings at war with each other that basically, you know, just to kind of make it light, so one, of them stole the, 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 one of them stole the toy from the other one at age two and they never forgave him. You know, <laughs> obviously it's a bigger thing than that. But they want us to be at peace. And this is the final messages that I received. They've told me many times that Earth is playing out scenarios that have happened all over the universe. We have scenarios playing out right now within the human expression that are identical to that, right? Um, all around the world. Um,
love the ones you hate. Mm -hmm. Don't wait. <laughs> don't wait around for them to change. Don't wait around to be in their countries where they're imposing things that you don't want to be a part of. Don't wait around for them to wake up. Create the world that you want. Go where you want. Move forward with knowing and without fear, without the investment in someone having to change for you to be you. There will be a time to change. Love the ones you hate because the ones you hate are bringing you the way that you need to see the experiences you need to receive in order for you to be fully liberated beings. Loving the ones you hate is the hardest thing for most humans. But loving the one you hate doesn't mean having to be in their presence, having to be gaslit by them, having to receive traumas they inflict on you, having to listen to all their words that they go by you, having to lose your sovereignty because they say that they own your sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It means you love them because you know you are them. You love them because you've been them. Mm. And you love them because they came here for you. And that is the bigger picture. Love the ones you hate. You might not hate guys. You might just dislike. You might just be not in resonance with. Love the ones that you disagree with and don't wait for others to change. And the way to love them is to know that they came here for you. These souls, whether they are aware of it or not, whether they're unconscious or they were conscious higher dimensional beings that came to be dark or whether they were dark beings that came to be dark, right? They came here for you to have the contrast you need to wake up in a world of amnesia. Without that darkness aspect, without the shadow reality, there was no way that we were going to remember, right? We would have just maintained the status quo. That's why when it comes to the UFOs and all this information and every time they do anything that tries to back some sort of agenda of drip disclosure, all they're doing, all it does is backfire and make more people aware that this is a phenomenon, this is a reality, and what does this mean for humanity? So I was getting this message and I just want to play the ending here again. Just to kind of speak about that. Having to be in their presence, having to be gaslit by them, having to receive traumas they inflict on you. And love the one you hate doesn't mean that you need to be around the presence of people, you, things that you don't agree with. Doesn't mean you need to allow yourself to be gaslit by them. Doesn't mean that you need to absorb and take on their traumas. Loving doesn't mean that you are accepting atrocities that have been committed, right? But Ultimately, the way we can love it is realizing we are interconnected and that they came to give you that contrast, right? They came to give you that contrast. And the only way we're ever going to create this paradoxical, beautiful, harmonious world is by coming to a sense of peace within us. And what happens when we come to a peace within us? We don't have hatred. We don't have anger towards others. Instead, we have love. Having to use your sovereignty because they say that they own your sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It means you love them because you know you are them. You love them because you've been them. And you love them because they came here for you. And one of the deepest components is, guys, love them because you've been them, right? Many people may think that they just had had nice, um, beautiful lives where they've just been good people, right? That we've been a lot of things. We don't just incarnate just to experience one polarity. We incarnate to experience the range of polarity. And the reason we came down to you earth, told me many times the reason why earth. we came down to earth was to experience a range of frequency from the darkest of the dark to the lightest of light. We have been them. We have been in these roles many times. A lot of us working to correct the timelines and correct the um, um, bring the ascension on the planet could have actually been in some lives, not maybe all of them, but some lives actually responsible for the fall. You know, I've had a lot of great lives, my past lives, that the ones that I remember, but I also had some crazy ones where I was responsible for the fall of Egypt, for example. You know, I was responsible for taking us away from a higher consciousness to a lower one. However, the earth was shifting into a lower frequency. 
the, the ages were dropping into the Kali Yuga and the Dwarpa Yuga. It was inevitable. The energy of the planet, the energy of the solar system, the energy, the consciousness was supporting a devolution, right? How could you even judge someone when they're literally a, a part of a system that is dictating the experiences we could have? Yes, we can become aware in any moment. We can shift out of it. But that wasn't what we signed up for here. We signed up to have these dark experiences, to have these forgetfulnesses in order to clock in experiences that maybe hasn't been done before. This is a very, very unique experience. And we are very blessed to be able to experience such a range of polarity on this earth. 